I am a major believer in reinvention and redemption. Improvement isn't just a concept to me, it's a philosophy, a way of living. It's rare when you manage to get something quite right in one shot, and there's almost always a way to be better somehow. I love improvement and applaud progress, especially when something with potential comes around. When I made a video on the viral hit game Sarah's Missing, I was expecting its development team would probably move on to a new concept next, having just taken on the story and idea of the found smartphone mystery in front of a very large audience. My stance was that even though Sarah's Missing had quite a few flaws holding it back, I felt confident that Kagan Games would show improvement with their next release, whatever it might be. It took only two days of hearing about an apparent sequel to Sarah's Missing, Simulacra, when I received an email I never expected to get. Jeremy, designer and writer at Kagan Games, reached out personally with a message. The development team had actually watched my Dark Arcade video about Sarah's Missing. Apparently, all of my criticism had been heard, accepted, and incorporated in the process of designing the spiritual sequel to Sarah's Missing, Simulacra. I was invited to try out the new game and given a Steam key, with only one request. Please apply the same critical thought you did for our last game. It helps us, developers, to improve and iterate on future projects that we worked on. This was entirely unexpected and unprecedented. No one has ever reached out to me like this. Even in the full scope of people who review games and the developers who make them, I feel as if this never really happens. I wasn't exactly nice in my video about Sarah's missing, and had concerns while writing the script about how negative I was going to come across. Imagine my surprise when the team who made such a breakaway hit listened to my harsh critique of a public prize winner and then said, Thank you. Here's a copy of our new piece. Tell us what you think. <laughs> I accepted the invitation in a heartbeat and thanked the team for this opportunity. This has never happened to me before, and it is a really gracious, considerate, professional gesture. I'm incredibly thankful for Kagan Games for reaching out to me and for watching my critical video on Sarah's Missing in the first place, especially considering the stance that I took. I guess it's just another bit of evidence supporting a lesson I've learned over and over again doing YouTube. You never know who's watching, and you would be very, very surprised to find out. It never ceases to amaze me who shows up and tells me that they're a viewer. So, after a few hours exploring Simulacra, I'm ready to deliver some feedback. The first bit of it being, I really didn't expect it to be, effectively, a second shot at the concept of the first game with three times the effort. This is essentially a reboot of Sarah's Missing with full intent to deliver a much stronger, smarter experience. Simulacra is another found smartphone mystery game, and again, you as a player are looking for its missing owner, who is now named Anna. You can find quite a few ideas from Sarah's Missing in here through the apps you can use on the phone, the content of emails and text messages, and again, the overall idea. You're even given the same unsupportive, apathetic mother who does not respect your career choices, a nasty pervert sending you unsolicited flirtations, okay, actually, a lot of them now since a dating app becomes a huge part of the gameplay and story, a boyfriend who's not the best choice of partner for you or anyone at all, really, and a friend who loves to go out on the town. But even with familiar ground in terms of characters and their relation to the missing girl, you find new ideas and an overall better approach. Characters in Sarah's Missing were tough to believe on the whole. You couldn't fully buy into their reality as people, which showed in the way they came across as bad movie cliches of smartphone-addicted millennials. This time, even the cheesiest of characters are made legitimate through moments of bleed-through as genuine humans with a range of emotional expression. The most offensive and impossible to believe character of all, Iris, the incredibly advanced AI from like, the year 2028, is gone for good, so you aren't being strung along by a version of Siri that is somehow capable of complex emotions and situational awareness. Instead, you're on your own, digging through the phone to find answers and sometimes receiving guidance from people who know Anna and want her found. Going through the phone this time is much more interesting. You have options of using new apps and communicating in different ways, using the phone in general much more to get what you need. It feels as if you're a lot more proactive overall with the device and the information you have, and it's rewarding when you predict how much you'll be using information before its time arrives. Speaking of information, there is a lot of it now, and while much of it doesn't have to do with the core mystery, connections exist between objectives and information that make total sense in context. For example, in Sarah's Missing, we had plenty of evidence that let us know in advance that Sarah was into paranormal circumstances and getting involved with people who could not be trusted. While we don't have any information on the phone that doesn't reveal itself to be related to the core mystery until you think about it after the ending in Simulacra, so much of the facts related to its owner come into play for getting what you need to go further. Making access to clues depend on answering security questions that require knowing Anna's personal details which are found throughout the phone? Nice. There we go. That's really using the format you're playing with. This, however, cannot be said of the majority of information on the phone. 
Granted, with a setup like this, you need to have about 70% set dressing and 30% clues, but it's kind of rough to go through the entire gallery and video log only to find... nothing, really. We have evidence concerning the nature of Anna's relationships, some silly shots of Anna herself, and images that, because they're corrupted, you assume are going to be important. So when you stumble across your first restoration challenge, you think you're about to find something really great. And in a way, you actually do. Say, what's the first impression you get looking at this puzzle? It's some kind of tile slider, right? Nothing we haven't seen before. Except that this one has a new spin on it. Some of the spaces are corrupted and can be covered up and repaired by selecting the next correct sequence. Ultimately, you need to finish the puzzle by putting down a layer with no corruption in such a way that all the spots underneath have been covered. I think that this is a very clever twist on an old mechanic, and using the restore tool built into the app that was mentioned in an email from a tech specialist gives us some logical justification for this mechanic existing. Unfortunately, you spend most of your decryption challenges solving images that give you... honestly, nothing of value. There is one picture that actually needs you to perform restoration to get something necessary for moving ahead, but aside from that, I realized I spent a lot of time fixing pictures that weren't rewarding at all. Likewise, the text restoration challenges didn't really give us anything. The reward for solving the puzzle is already inside the pieces laid out right in front of you. If you see the bulk of a message even while scrambled, you basically know what's being said. And even if you somehow don't, the way conversations carry on provide context clues for you to figure it out, which should really be easy as you do see words rearranging themselves into somewhat intelligible patterns in the corrupted message the entire time. I spent so many moments fixing broken text messages that gave me basically nothing in return, thinking that, at least, it might have an impact in the future or at the end of the game. Maybe all along I was being... scored on how much I was fixing the phone and it would impact my ending. But as far as I can tell, I was just using up more of my time playing word scramble. Would it be smart to put restoration challenges in the way of messages as well as images? Yeah, definitely. If we aren't being given the reward through the presentation of the challenge itself, and if the reward we actually get is... rewarding. I really don't need to solve a picture of Anna and Ashley just taking a selfie and hanging out when I already have so many pictures of Anna and Ashley hanging out, and... When I have another picture of Anna and Ashley taking the same selfie? And hold on a minute, if Anna's taking the selfie with Ashley, who took these two pictures of them? Was she holding Ashley's phone while her boyfriend Greg used hers? Then how did the two selfie pictures and the selfie itself all end up on the same phone under automatic sequential image file titles? Why did they take one selfie in that exact spot, stop to eat, and then resume the same position after for more pictures? All of these images apparently took place on July 13th. How do you justify all that when all these pictures came from the same camera folder? And also, does anybody else notice that in these pictures, Ashley is wearing different clothes? So, they set up a selfie that somebody else took a picture of. Ashley got changed, then they went to eat, and then Ashley changed back so they could set up the same exact selfie position. Again, having someone else hold Anna's phone, even though the actual selfie resulting from this position pretty much relates to the way she was holding the phone we saw in her hand. <laughs> what kind of Alice in Wonderland logic is this? Guys, guys, I know this is a fun horror mystery game, but when its foundation is set knee deep in realistic portrayal, you've got to really sell it and make the reality cohesive on all fronts. Really odd, impossible things like this you can tell were mistakes on the production side throw off the momentum of belief in a player who is studying the work looking for clues. And in a game like this, almost all of your players are browsing carefully through files and folders looking for clues. Mistakes like these are going to be caught. Always check your timelines, always make sure pictures being taken with a smartphone would and could end up on the phone, and let's keep it all in order so we don't have crazy time jumps like this. And really, really never put together pictures from different photo shoots to fill the phone's gallery under the same day scheduled on the phone unless your models wear the same outfits to both shoots. Really though, I am nitpicking over an honest mistake that, when you think about it, is actually pretty funny. Let's just move on to discussing a mechanic I enjoyed. Giving the player progress markers using video rewards. Whenever a significant part of the story was solved, one of Anna's phone vlogs would be unlocked. Or in this case, it would finish syncing from whatever server it was stored on. It would give us small bits of Anna thinking a lot about her situation during that moment in time. And even though what she talked about didn't really relate to the core mystery, it is nice to have that pat on the back. When you find the videos are locked while digging around, your first instinct is to unlock them. Good use of progress markers and rewards. More good examples of progress and rewards coming at the same time can be found in data restorations on the phone. 
backups of the system saved by Anna hold information that you previously had no access to, and these can be very enlightening stages of the game. It's a pretty great way to pull off the trick of restoring information without having the all-powerful Iris do it for you, as seen in Sarah's Missing. I completely support any game mechanic that reflects actual, real things that can happen with a phone and devices the phone can be connected to. It really helps your foundation of belief. This is a very smart way of solving the deleted evidence issue. Good job, guys. Interactivity between apps, as mentioned earlier, also gives Simulacra a lot of points. You can end up receiving a webpage from a character in one app, which includes a form you can fill out, resulting in receiving an email from that website that helps you move ahead. Even picking up clues about the potential capability of people Anna's been in contact with, like her skeevy co-worker Merv the Perv, and then giving us a choice of whether or not to use him in a particular situation, is fantastic use of the information displayed in apps and interconnection. Equally great is Jabber, the Twitter parody, which can be used to advance the story through really clever means. The idea to use updates on the Jabber app as a scare tactic to increase mystery and cause new developments in the plot was wonderful and unexpected. It's a surreal kind of experience to dig through a missing girl's phone and look at all the information already on there. It's a whole new level to suddenly have these apps come to life and spill out new details beyond use of text messages we already expect we'll need to act on. Talking about Jabber's updates brings me to another point that needs to be addressed, because as much as Simulacra has a serious improvement over Sarah's missing, the ball was dropped again concerning something that I thought would have been pretty obvious this time. Random jump scares have got to die. They are ineffective, they are annoying, they throw you out of the game and make you angry instead of scared, and above all else, considering the core mystery of the story and its reveal, they don't make any sense to have. Get rid of jump scares. You don't need to keep using these terrible pop-up scares. The essence of fear lies in creating the feeling that we're going to be attacked by a jump scare and then teasing us and teasing us and teasing us more than any minute now. We're about to get destroyed by a pop-up or reveal so terrifying we're gonna throw our keyboard at the screen in self-defense. Small crazy glitches of Anna looking distorted? Bad. Having the wallpaper on the phone change every time it reboots to show a slightly different Anna and creeping us out? Good. Do not just throw things in our face and yell, Boo! Gotcha! You are a professional, not a 16-year-old writing creepypasta based on a Nintendo game from the 90s. You want to know what really worked when it came to fear tactics in Simulacra? It's such a small, simple detail, but it works so well. Background Ambience You gave us an image of a background. You put us inside of a room this time, and every so often the lighting in that room flickers or slowly dims down, driving up the sense that we might not be alone. And maybe, just maybe, we're gonna need to put down the phone and face something that we aren't looking at. The paranoia about this gets so much worse when you hear noises in the background. Sound cues like somebody breathing and the creaking of floorboards and doors opening really make you think about how alone you might actually be. After all, it's said in the game that you found the phone on your doorstep. How did it end up there? What if whoever dropped it is still around? Waiting. Watching. Paranoia is so important in horror games. It's how you create the sense that a jump scare is coming, and it makes us afraid to keep going with whatever we're doing. Giving me points of paranoia while I played was so effective. I often did stop what I was doing to consider the noise that I just heard from inside the house after 15 minutes of hearing nothing but the sounds of a smartphone. It's incredibly disconcerting. Something else that was effective, albeit pretty strange, involves a section in the middle of the game concerning a phone reboot. You have to go through a system setup, basically making the phone yours, and as part of the setup guide, the operating system asks you some pretty... odd and intrusive questions that really play with your sense of paranoia. It really does its best to attack you directly when it asks, are you paranoid that your phone or laptop camera might be recording your every move? You're asked about swearing to tell the truth, and then if you'd rather know the date or cause of your death, followed by a choice between losing your mind or all of your limbs. We then get... Okay, so this one's about halfway genius and halfway silly, so I'm still conflicted on my feelings between being impressed and wanting to roll my eyes over it. But the next question is... If you look behind you right now, would you rather see a floating disembodied head or a headless body? And then it goes for the jugular. I have no conflicts about this one. It really does a good job of messing with you and driving up your paranoia. Can I touch your hair? And of course the image is a hand reaching for someone who is looking down at a screen in the dark. So what is all of this for? Apparently data collection by Iris OS. Yes, Iris is technically still around, even though she's been downgraded from a ridiculously overpowered AI to just the operating system. 
Eventually, the reboot does fix itself, putting Anna's phone back in the condition it was before you were asked a bunch of insane startup questions, and you do get to carry on, but you won't be forgetting about that odd experience. Does that entire sequence have anything at all to do with the core mystery of the game? Maybe. It could be the start of something that you wouldn't want to get caught up in, or it could be laying the groundwork for something that may come out in the future, which we're teased about in the game through a secret path we'll be touching on later. No matter what, it does feel effective. Now, if it never correlates to anything at some point, that is an issue. But for the time being, I know that moment had impact and definitely made me wonder what exactly I was dealing with in the game. And now, let's address just that. What it is we're dealing with at the end. I'm not going to give away too much, because it actually is pretty good this time and does make more sense than what happened in Sarah's Missing. Instead of creepypasta meets smartphone, we're dealing with some real black mirror horror bordering on cosmic science fiction. Meet the Simulacra, a force of existence created by the life humanity has breathed into the internet, a god generated by machines capable of reaching through the glass. Anna is the latest to fall victim to a trap set by the Simulacra, and even though you found her, you might not necessarily get her back. Her kidnapper has some very strict ideals and very big plans. In speaking with the monster, you are once again forced to make a life or death choice that really isn't easy and definitely not fair. And through the journey you experience along the way, you really are given reason to pause and think about it this time. In Sarah is Missing, we had a real problem of not having our characters humanize enough to make the choice difficult, as well as evidence leading to choose one party to die over the other because the entire situation was basically their fault, and also we didn't know them from a hole in the wall. In Simulacra, we've got a heavy burden on our hands, where neither of the choices are at fault for what's happening, and you have emotional stake in seeing both of them live, while not wishing to punish either of them. You know what this is called? A way better ending than the one seen in Sarah is Missing. Good job, Kagan Games! Always make choice problems weigh heavy on the player by building up emotional stake and humanization in both people who have been placed in the guillotine. We know you want it to be difficult, and so do we. Fun fact for everybody, there are actually four endings to this game, so even with the choice factor at the end, you've got more than two ways to see a conclusion. It's excellent to have that territory of branching paths to walk at the end of a game where we've been making choices all along. The Simulacra is an enemy that feels really right for a game of this nature. You can tell pretty much any kind of story you can successfully execute based on technology in this format, but sticking to a theme of technology and humanity's relationship with it feels right. The existence of the Simulacra and the ideas around it work quite well and bring this game into the territory of art. A statement is being made, something big is being said, and it's not ham-fisted or painfully obvious. I think even with the flaws that do exist in Simulacra, that Kaigen Games has succeeded in making a much stronger version of the concept behind Sarah's Missing. It feels better, it runs better, it makes more sense overall, it has better impact, and aside from those jump scares that need to go away already, the scare factor is better. Writing was given special attention this time, characters were fleshed out and made more human, and the concept of using a smartphone and its applications was utilized to a much more satisfying degree. This is a major improvement and shows that once again, Kagan Games has great potential and skill, and they also can and will improve over previous designs and attempts. Sarah is Missing left me with the feeling that it would be great to see that concept done better. Simulacra leaves me with the confirmation that it could and would be done, and now that it has, I'm feeling excited for what Kagan Games can do next. The only bit of criticism I have left concerns something very petty, but also very easy to fix. Voice acting. Anna was great, Ashley was great, Taylor was pretty good, and the Simulacra was awesome. Greg's voice acting, his lines, and his entire style of presentation? Painful. I'm sorry, but the first time you hear a voice line in the game, it comes from Greg, and it's the absolute worst first impression you can get for how voice acting is going to be in this. He is the only one who seriously breaks your immersion for believing in the reality and humanity of these characters, not only because his lines are terrible and cliche, but his vocal delivery and performance style was atrocious. I am a voice guy. I narrate videos for a living, I'm quite sensitive to performance, and I cannot overlook this. The hilarious part of this criticism, I know, is that the same guy voicing Greg did the voice for the simulacra, which was great and memorable. He also played the detective, which was an acceptable performance, but a character I felt wasn't really needed. So yeah, I really don't know what went wrong with Greg. I'm sorry, it's just something I seriously cannot get past. I wanted to shut off my speakers every time I heard him. And now for the fun part. The Big Easter Egg So, if you open up the web browser surfer and go to the Iris OS webpage, then scroll to the bottom, you'll see these dashes and dots. 
Take note of the sequence. This is Morse code, and we'll be using it shortly. Click on the area and a page of script will roll by while numbers are read, giving you a phone number you can dial in the game. You are shown this symbol and hear a new string of numbers. It's part of the first sequence for the math concept known as Pi. You must then enter in the next four numbers of the sequence, 6535. You'll receive a new text message contact. Gateway 31. Initiate conversation and wait for it to speak. It will tell you the first part of the Morse code message, a windy convergence. You must deliver the rest of it. A polar feathered bear waddles above the hammer. You will be told, Providence has spoken. Entropy has taken form once more. Complete your task. You have much to witness. Much later in the game, you'll receive a new message and will be asked what you doubt. Respond, Iris. You'll be told not to worry. Its existence is only revealed to its chosen. We must find Milton Keynes on a midsummer morning to find the truth. Milton Keynes is a town in England. What it has to do with a midsummer morning is beyond our current understanding. But one thing's for sure. The developers have a new idea in mind, and they've planted the seed in Simulacra. And that's about it. Once again, I'm very thankful for the invitation from Jeremy of Kagan Games to play Simulacra, and even more thankful for such positive reception and acceptance of my previous video on Sarah's Missing. It's never easy to hear criticism of your work, but the best thing a creator can do is listen, think about how to apply it, and make improvements. And that is precisely what happened here. Simulacra is quite an improvement over Sarah's Missing, and it leaves me excited for the next project. Thanks to all of you for watching, and thanks especially to my supporters on Patreon, who keep the machines in the Dark Arcade running. Stick around to see the names of all these awesome creatures of the night. That's all for now, everybody. Thanks for joining me in the dark again this evening. Once more, I'm Nick Nocturne, and I'll be seeing you again real soon. Sleep tight.